actually, this session is actually on advanced interventions for, for um, AOT conditions. And our first talk is by Rachel Bell. Rachel will be talking on uh, new patterns of delivery for cardiovascular services. Why have they not been accepted? Thank you very much, Obi. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, so, what are these patterns of delivery that uh, haven't been accepted by you? I think, I think what uh, the um, meeting organisers were, were leaning towards is your cardiothoracic GERFT and my previously um, written service specification for the management of thoracic aortic disease. So. Uh, I've spoken at this meeting several and many other meetings about how we felt there was a geographic uh, variation around the country that was, you know, not appropriate and that if you live in certain areas, you got very good treatment for your aortic dissection and your thoracic aortic disease. But if you lived in other areas, there simply wasn't any service available and how we felt we needed to change that. And a group of cardiac surgeons and vascular surgeons spent a lot of time, and interventional radiologists, um, spent a lot of time putting together what we thought was a pragmatic approach for reorganising services for NHS England. And then just, I think, peri-COVID, um, I got told that NHS England had decided not to take forward the service specification. Um, and uh, that was it. And so I spent a couple of evenings being really, really angry. Uh, about that um, for obvious reasons and then I got another phone call to say could I participate in another group that was dealing with writing a toolkit for aortic dissection for the country which was being led by Graham Cooper and the SKIP program for cardiothoracics um, and so I thought don't throw the baby out with the bathwater Rachel get involved because maybe we'll be able to get something out of it so I don't think that we've managed to totally go with the GERFT recommendations for cardiothoracic surgery. We certainly haven't managed to enact our service specification. For those of you who haven't read the cardiothoracic GERFT report, it basically suggested that aortic surgery, this is really revolutionary stuff, should be done by surgeons who do aortic <coughs> surgery and do it in decent quantities. And it should be done in high volume centres because you get much better outcomes. So why is change so difficult in the NHS? Um, I have been involved in many change projects in my career to date, and I think it's many people resist it. Some even seek <laughs> to undermine it. And if you look at all big transformation projects in the National Health Service, only 26% of them are ever successful. What I do know is that the most successful uh, change is driven by empowerment and not by top-down uh, mandate. And the best thing to do is to start with a small group who are enthusiastic, identify what you want to change, set up a network of people that are also equally enthusiastic, put multiple people in charge that have the same values, uh, and accept that it's going to take time and that one small word, but so important in the NH NHS, resource. I think change in the NHS as opposed to other environments is even more difficult because it's a beast to deal with it. There is incredible inertia, no resources, I've said. It's actually easier to stay as you are. There's no incentive to change. Often we have historical referral precedents, you know, so I've got a lovely mate who works at Guy's and St Thomas's, so I'm going to send all my dissections there even though I work in Truro. You know, I, that sort of thing, and we've all seen it. Um, and the other one is, well, I'm all right, Jack, because, you know, my hospital's really good at this and I don't need to help the nation change. Then we've obviously had COVID distraction, which has been a, a problem for certain projects like this. And then you've just got to add into that the uncertainty of general elections and politics and the fact that NHS England just closed down for weeks on end when you're about to go into a general election and put all projects on hold and then have a massive staff rearrangement and you haven't got the same person you were dealing with when you come back. So it's not always been the case. So I would like to put forward that there have been some successful reconfigurations of services in the past. And I think the best example actually is the Healthcare for London uh, 2007, Lord Darcy's uh, try. And he started with stroke and trauma services. It was called the London Cardiovascular Review. And I'm pretty sure that everybody in this room was involved in some form. And it involved cardiac surgery, vascular and cardiology. 
And the way they did it was they handed it over to the London commissioners when they'd finished to carry on the work. And the aim, again, was high volume, better outcome. So why was this project successful and why have none of the others been successful? Well, I think it was well led. It was resourced. It engaged lots of stakeholders around the capital. It ran at a good pace. It was backed by the London commissioners and all the senior leaders were involved. And it aligned codependent specialties and linked major changes to the stroke and trauma pathways, which are still in place today and still working. So what do we really need to change in cardiovascular service delivery? Well, with my hobby horse, I would say that currently we are failing patients with acute aortic syndromes around the country. It is a genuine postcode lottery as to where you will go, whether you'll even get a diagnosis. There are delays to transfer to a place of safety. You're often treated by a non-specialist. And we know that there have been concerns raised nationwide by coroners and patient groups because of poor outcomes and young deaths. I spent yesterday in Bristol at the Acute uh, Dissection Awareness Day, which was packed with harrowing stories from relatives about you know, their beloved family members having gone to hospital three or four times and then eventually dying in their living room without a diagnosis. Um, and it just shows how poorly we just don't... I went into medicine because I wanted to make a difference and I wanted to look after people, and they're the, the right group of people. We need to have their back. We need to be there when they fall, and we are genuinely failing them. And I think we need to reflect on our motivations and excuses for not driving the change that is required, because it's not actually about us. It's about the patients. Managing change is incredibly difficult, even when you do it in small groups, but for this, it requires change within your small group, within your organisation, but even worse, between organisations. Um, and it just becomes increasingly more complicated. What I've learned about change to date is I think you have to tell your story really well. You have to tell the truth. You have to keep going, because I've been at this aortic dissection pathway now since 2015. Uh, you have to invite participation, make sure everybody knows which direction you're travelling, provide training if need be, but also be a strong leader. So this is the third attempt <laughs> to get this right. This is the Emergency Aortic Dissection Pathway Toolkit. Um, so we have decided to be very straightforward uh, and we've set it up as under seven key principles. And the toolkit will come to you when it comes to you in electronic format, but also on paper if you want it. And each tab, when you push on it, I haven't got the next page, will give you a list of things that we think you need to have in place. So the idea is very similar to, oddly enough, because I was involved in writing this, with the previous service specification in that we give you regional control and we say, this is your region, you tell us how it's going to work in Yorkshire or Northumberland, or Surrey. Um, we want an aortic lead for each region who is going to work and collaborate with all the units so that you know what your pathways are. And we will provide you with resource, so coming with the toolkit, as we very amusingly said yesterday, you need some tools in your toolkit. Uh, so we're going to provide uh, all the best practice guides that we've got from around the country, so people who've already written transfer protocols, spinal cord protection documents, uh, pathway documents, patient information leaflets, whatever, so that you can plagiarise them for your region and make them personal for you so that they work, but that they're there and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So there is a governance principle, there's coordination through MDT meetings, there's a regional rota that, with a single point of contact, there's uh, an ability and a requirement to make sure that you have timely and reliable image transfer, uh, that the patient then gets transferred safely, and that you have all the right people on site to deal with them. And principle seven, which I think is actually really important, is um, <coughs> certainly after yesterday, is a regional education programme that rolls and rolls and rolls for all EDs, for all junior doctors, because aortic dissection, whilst it's our commonest aortic emergency, is one of the small causes of 
of chest pain and you know they're trying to pick out the one that's got aortic dissection from all of those that have cardiac chest pain and other other types of chest pain um, so what are we asking from you we're empowering you to make the change and to follow our simple rules I'm really sorry it doesn't come with money and I really wish it did um, uh, but it, we, we will give you some tools to help you. It is going to require you to do that difficult change and collaborate between organisations. And there are some quality indicators to help us monitor everybody's performance to make sure that we know we are doing better. So, in summary, I'm imploring you to do the right thing. We really do need to do this better for the patients. It's only going to be possible with your help and as I said, the toolkit is our third attempt to engage and empower you to take control of your regional pathways for acute aortic dissection. Thank you very much. Brilliant talk, brilliantly delivered, one minute overload. Bijan is going to talk to us about open and endo, the hybrid approach in 10 minutes. I will stick to 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I've put uh, all the team members here because I think this sort of work, and I've got a couple of places to il illustrate it, illustrates how this type of complex aortic work should be done in teams. Uh, so this is what we mostly understand by hybrid repair of aortic pathology, retrograde revascularization of blanches, but I think for most of us this has had variable results and uh, we're going away from this. I'm here to talk about adjunctive use of open surgery to enable um, branched and fenestrated endografting. And how can we uh, leverage uh, open enthusiast team members that we have to work with those that are endovascular enthusiasts? Well, a DACON graft <coughs> creates a very good proximal and distal landing zone. We can use open surgery to preserve collateral supply, which is really important, collateral supply to the spinal cord, which is really important when you're uh, covering a lot of aorta. It can be a, a, a strategy to stage um, extensive aortic repairs, and obviously it can also be used to rescue endovascular failures, such as uh, occluded branches, for example, that can be retrograde revascularized using the techniques in that first slide. So a DACRON graft provides an excellent landing zone. It um, may be used as a strategy to uh, employ branch and fenestrated stent grafting in patients with connective tissue disease, and I'll show you with a couple of cases how we've used that. Um, and it is very important if you're going to do that, that if you fashion uh, anything with a DACRON graft, that you future-proof that patient. Why is that important? Well, uh, look at this uh, series where um, they uh, looked at landing endovascular landing zones, and they had just under 600 native, um, 79 Dacron. And the endo leaks happened in the first tertile of their experience when the Dacron crafts they were fashioning were short. So if you're going to use a Dacron landing zone, it's got to be four centimeters or more. Okay, so this. Uh, is uh, a patient with Marfans in his uh, mid-40s, had had an endovascular repair a few years prior. Look at how well the stent grafts had been performing over the ensuing years, but a dilated aorta, very damaged aorta, um, not a candidate for open repair, um, and uh, a dissected, dilated uh, um, iliac, so no real landing zone with a smaller right kidney that came off a lumen that was not connected to the true lumen. So um, this is in fact something that Morad Salam and Rachel Bell did together when she was with us. So creation of a landing zone with a Dacron graft, a crossover graft to uh, revascularize the uh, right system, flicking the native external iliac onto the origin of the internal iliac to preserve that collateral supply a separate graft uh, from, from the Dacron graft to the left internal iliac artery, and for good measure, a bypass up to the right kidney. So kudos to Morad and Rachel, I think amazing, amazing work. But what that then means is that you can use, in this case, a T branch to dock into the previous thoracic endograft and then repair the intervening segment of the aorta. So T-branch in with an aorta uniiliac device on the, on the left side, relying on that crossover graft to supply the right leg. The, unfortunately, the, the, the 
right kidney was small, the bypass was again onto a very small renal artery, and that occluded. So we plugged the uh, branch for the right uh, um, kidney, and the satisfactory result in this uh, case. So successful sealing of the uh, false lumen, uh, and you can see here both internal iliacs and the uh, right iliac system perfused. Um, another case, this is again a patient with Marfan's in his uh, late 60s. Uh, this, uh, this repair was staged. Um, the cardiothoracic colleagues did uh, the proximal end first, and you can see that here. So the, the proximal end was repaired first. He had a stormy course getting over that, took a few months. And then the, the, we thought that he should have an open repair of the inferenal segment so that we could go from Dacron to Dacron. Okay, so we think that that is a safe strategy to sealing Dacron above, Dacron below, and repair the intervening segment with a fenestrated stent graft. The only thing, so these aren't common procedures, uh, but as a team, you have to approach these cases in a, in, in a nuanced way when they do come along. So look at this uh, series uh, by Stefan Allen's uh, group. Um, out of a total of uh, uh, just under 450, 17 of them had connective tissue with early results um, that were reasonable. Uh, this is another uh, big uh, American series of uh, chronic dissections treated with branch and fenestrated stem graft. Again, you see the small proportion uh, that had connective tissue disease. The only, I guess, consideration with these cases is what's going to happen to the mating stents that go into a renal artery or a superior mesenteric artery in a patient with Marfan's. The cases that we have done to date, we haven't had problems long term, and you don't see reports of them in the literature, only the occasional reports, such as this case published this year, but this patient did have Ehlers Danlos syndrome. And uh, you can see here that over time, and I think it was a year after, this right renal artery is dilated around the mating stent, giving you a type 1C leak, and that needed to be extended. So not a big hit reintervention, but nonetheless, it's a consideration, I think, in, in patients with connective tissue disease. Okay, so again, I said I'll only take 10 minutes. I just want to ch change tack for the um, um, last few slides. This is a hobby horse of mine in that uh, it, why not consider wrapping of the proximal ascending aorta to facilitate endovascular repair? Again, not a uh, huge series reported uh, in the literature. This is a recent bar, one again by Stefan Hollande's group, and I'm grateful to him for the videos and some of the content. Um, he, with his cardiothoracic colleagues, in 35 patients who weren't a candidate for uh, definitive open repair, uh, but presented with type A dissections, uses a, a Teflon wrap, a 120 centimeter Teflon wrap, to wrap the, the dissection. And obviously that can be done off pump. And this is the mortality that they, uh, that they report with this technique. And interestingly, when they looked at the CT appearances of the ascending after this procedure, you can see quite a high proportion of them would subsequently have been can a candidate for endovascular repair with devices such as uh, arch branch uh, endografts. The other um, technique, I guess, we should consider for wrapping is pairs. And we, you know, we have uh, expertise uh, uh, with regard to pairs in, uh, in this room. Again, uh, cardiothoracic colleagues are hesitant, but it's something that I've brought up a few times. Well, you know, why can't we wrap admittedly an atherosclerotic adult dilated aorta with something bespoke like this in order to create uh, a landing zone. We, there is a significant experience with pairs, admittedly in patients with connective tissue disease, so different uh, uh, material. But again, I think it's something that's worth considering. So in a case like this, just to remind you, you need 38, uh, a maximum diameter of 38 millimeters in order to seal proximally for an arch branch device, for example, in the ascending aorta. So if you've got a case like this, you only need a few millimeters uh, in order to facilitate that sort, of, uh, that sort of repair. So some food for discussion. So in summary, um, there are a number of solutions that can leverage both open and end of ASCAR expertise for patients who aren't a candidate for uh, extensive definitive open repair. And I should say, 
none of this means that open repair isn't the definitive solution for, for example, patients with connective tissue. We're only talking about patients who can't have that option. Um, there is a whole toolbox, and they complement each other, and we owe it to them to use that, uh, but apply it to carefully selected patients and plan, and, but also execute the operation in teams so that your endovascular colleague is happy with the Dacron graft, for example, that's uh, fashioned. Done. Uh, well done, Bijan and team. That's some real good lateral thinking and, um, you know, very, a lot of hard work there. Well done, well done. We'll move on swiftly to Christian. Is he present? Online. Okay, that's fine. He'll be talking to us uh, from Leipzig, yes, on intercostal embolization to stimulate collateralization. Everyone can hear me? Yep. Uh, hi. I'm Krista, Toby, and Colin. Um, I have to apologize for not being uh, with you guys in London. Personally, it's due to the dramatic development here in the Heart Center in, in Leipzig, with uh, um, some attendings being uh, long-term leave and sick, so uh, I just couldn't leave. Um, I'm honored to uh, talk to you about the intercostal embolization to stimulate the collateralization um, to protect the spinal cord in open and endovascular repair. Next slide, please. Um, you, yeah, maybe go one back and we see these. So wh what I'm going to show you is how to prevent um, perfusion deficits um, in elective cases. And the this technology is currently under investigation in a large trial I'm going to show you later on. It's a relatively simple uh, technique and it's applicable for open and endovascular repair. Next slide. We all know the incidences. Uh, this is the most devastating complication. This is what motivates me for a very long time already to uh, investigate and, um, and really try to um, push translational research in this area. Next slide, please. And it all started with these segmental arteries here. This is a picture from the lab. You see here how they arise from the aorta. Next slide, please. Um, here you see how a stent graft is covering the orifices, and this is why the spinal cord um, doesn't get enough uh, perfusion. Next slide. Um, this all goes back to Adam Kiewicz. This is the original uh, work from dating back to 1881, when he described this one artery that um, supposedly is responsible for spinal cord um, perfusion. Next slide, please. We have for a very long time uh, believed in this um, historical paradigm. Yeah, move on, please. Next slide. Um, you all know these beautiful drawings, and it's obvious that we were looking for this artery and trying to re-implant it. Next slide, please. But a uh, number of years back in 2006, in a series of 100 patients, where all segmental arteries that could uh, possibly represent this Adam Kivich artery were sacrificed, the actual paraplegia right, click one more, please, um, was 2% and the Aramkiewicz there by a clinical conundrum. Next slide. So we need a reassessment of the anatomy. This is the original work from my time in Mount Sinai. Next slide, please. And then you can just keep clicking and I will be walking through the uh, slides. This is an electron microscopic picture of actual spinal cord um, arterial network within the spinal canal. Click once again, please. And this is located in a rich collateral network. So we need to understand the physiology. Yeah, that's fine, keep going. We need to understand the physiology of, the, of this network and understand how we can actually um, trigger arterial remodeling within that network. Next slide. Um, for that purpose, we placed a pressure catheter in one of those segmental arteries. What you see here is a cast uh, actually, human cast. I took an illegal photograph 
when the Bodies exhibition uh, was visiting uh, New York at the time. Next slide. And if you measure the pressure in this catheter while sacrificing segmental arteries, you see this curve, you see that there's a dramatic um, decrease in blood pressure um, to the spinal cord. And after a while, 24, 48, 72, and then 120 hours, apparently this network is capable of recovering uh, pressure to the spinal cord. So we knew that there were mechanisms in place that could trigger regeneration. Next slide, please. And we translated all this into our own casts you see here. Next slide. Um, we were looking in this area. We were taking scanning electronic uh, pictures. So from a from a um, extremely high magnification, we could see that there was arteriogenesis. We could actually trigger arteriogenesis and generate collateralization. Next slide, please. Um, and then we came up with the idea that the stage repair would probably uh, do the trick. Next slide. And this, these are the experiments. And if you do that in a large animal model, you get exact same measurements as in humans. Then go back. Go next slide, please. And you get a 20 to 30% paraplegia rate. This is the conventional approach as we all used to do it uh, years back and sometimes even today. And then next slide. If you stage the approach, this is what happens. Click again. This the pressure. They're just one forward. Then you get a little. Yeah, yeah. Here you see the actual pressure is not anymore going down that dramatically. Next slide, and all all animals animals recovered. So it seemed that staged sacrifice would be enough to protect the spinal cord if, it, if the interval is only five days. Next slide. Obviously, this is one of those pigs that were capable of, um, of running around even though they shouldn't be able to move their hind limbs anymore. Next slide. So the theory was clear. We uh, um, validated our data retrospectively and it became clear that there's a 0% paraplegia rate in patients that had been operated by accident in the staged fashion in the past in the Sinai database. Next slide. That we got a dramatic. This is again from Stefan Alon's group here, and he was cited before by Bijan. I heard from the back room here. Um, even in endovascular repair, there was a dramatic tenfold reduction in paraplegia rate in, in, um, proven by Stefan Alon's group a couple of years back. Next slide. Um, so the question was, can we stimulate arteriogenesis prophylactically in the clinical scenario? Next slide. And we came up with um, what we called minimally invasive stage segmental artery coil embolization, Misaki. Next slide. And you see a short movie now. So next slide, please. And here you see how that actually is done. So we access most of the time the groins. We uh, search for the segmental arteries. This is a case, case chronic dissection from Leipzig. And then we go in with a, with a little catheter and place the uh, coils in the segmental arteries. That can be done um, with very little sedation in the, the awake patient. You see here the end result. Next slide. and. Uh, these are the first two patients. One was completed endovascularly, the other one with open repair. Next slide. This is always uh, the um, beginning when uh, we collaborated with uh, Tilo Kelbu, who I believe is sitting amongst you guys now in London, and Sebastian Lebus at the time when we did the first two patients. Next slide. So it was a promising um, approach. And you see here again the timeline, and it all ended up in the Papa Artist trial. Uh, next slide that um, we created. It's a plan for five iteration, 500 participants in 31 recruiting sites in nine countries. Next slide. See here who's all contributing. We are very happy that um, the UK was still a full member of the European Union as the trial is financed by the European Research Commission. Next slide. Um, the trial has already uh, produced a lot of um, really well-received um, sub-project results. Here's 
uh, paper from Ursula Simeonok, and I believe she's also amongst you guys now uh, in the audience somewhere. Um, next. And there are lots of uh, international awards with the sub projects were already um, um, nominated. Next slide. So here you see the actual recruitment curve from uh, yesterday. We are now at almost 130 randomized patients. We had a lo lot of issues, obviously, with administrative problems, with uh, European law, with local law, etc. And obviously, the, um, the pandemia would also uh, contribute to slowing us down. But I hope that we can pick up on uh, recruitment pace uh, very soon, and then we'll see, hopefully, the results of the trial. Next slide. And this is already um, my final slide. So I believe that this is a very promising um, idea and new technology. Level A evidence is missing, and I hope that we get this with a randomized controlled trial. Thank you very much. And again, sorry that I'm not being with you guys now. Christian, thank you so very, very much. It's brilliant work, as you know. I'm afraid we haven't got time for any questions because we're going to be thrown out of the room. Uh, but we can all save them up for next time we see you, which I hope is soon. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. The next talk is on... I've got fail. Uh oh, it's on new ideas for arch reconstruction in 2021. Oh, it's taken away. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, my talk is more uh, food for thoughts than uh, giving uh, a lot of advice, etc. So, what I want to start with is one of the most important advices I ever got in my life was imprinted by Denton Cooley in my head when I was with him in 2019. He was operating an ascending aorta. And he left uh, me and the senior register in the room and it was bleeding. And I said, uh, Mr. Dr. Cooley, there is a lot of blood. And he said one thing, my son, where there is blood, there is life. <laughs> <laughs> now, when we're talking about uh, what are the reasons for complex aortic arch replacement being still high risk operations in the year 2020, 40 years after we really started, then we have some questions. Obviously, there's circuitry arrest, which is necessary in these operations. That leads to irreversible peripheral organ injury, depending on time. Then there's malperfusion of the brain and spinal cord, which le leads to irreversible neurological injury. And then there's bleeding at the end of the operation, which might be unmanageable. So what can we take out of this equation when we're operating on arches nowadays? Now, first, we can take the malperfusion out of the equation, because we have methods how to perfuse the brain. And we can take the bleeding out of the equation because there are obviously certain ways how to control bleeding and how to control that we actually can control the bleeding. Now, this is the uh, typical arch replacement scenario on the left side. And uh, speaking in the words of uh, Bruce Williams von Berg, this is, un is controlled chaos. If you look at this, that's the aorta that's left from the arch. The entire arch is cut out. There are these cannulas in the carotid arteries perfusing the brain, according to the Kasui procedure, but they come in and out from time to time. They're in the way of the operation. You then we've got something sitting there in the root, and we have got this graft, and we have to all put it together again, and that takes obviously a long time. And it is, as I said, looking like something that uh, could be a car accident. Now, with regards to the neuroprotection, and with regards to the circuit arrests, which we cannot exclude in whatever op open arch operation we do, it is important to understand, we have heard that before, cooling is essential because cooling decreases the cerebral oxygen consumption. The more you cool down, the longer time you have. If you are down to 18 degrees, 20, 18 degrees, you have about 45 to 60 minutes in total circuit arrest before you are running into issues with organ damage, with increase of uh, lactate and other problems. Now, what does that mean, neuroprotection strategy in arch surgery? These are publications, and if you look at it, there are different ways, and it's completely chaotic. There's bilateral, unilateral, island graft, unilateral, bilateral, bilateral, cannulation site, innominate, left carotid, innominate, plus left, plus auxiliary artery. So everybody does what he thinks is the best, and even then, the perfusion amount is different. So at the end of the day, there is 
no real rule in the room. So the, it's not reproducible because you just do what you think is the right thing. Now, looking at what we want to achieve is we want to have good neurological outcome. We want to basically make sure that the, the spine and the brain is perfused all the time because that is something we can do during the operation while they're in circular rest. So the best cannulation sites are going into the right carotid, going into the left carotid, going into the ascending aorta, or going into the femoral artery. So these are the sites we can approach and we can make sure that we still have perfusion to the vessels. Now, if you look at the development, as I say, we are 40 years into operating the aortic arch, and besides that, we use different methods with different bars, and nothing has really changed. We are now getting a new uh, frozen elephant trunk um, on hands uh, from Cryolife, which is a trifurcated uh, graph, which allows us to actually go further into zone zero and zone one, which is important if you look at the spinal cord injury we can cause with uh, these uh, frozen elephant trunks. If you look at the uh, incidence, anything that goes further down than uh, TH6, TH7 increases the paraplegia rate exponentially. So we need to, stri need to stay as far proximal in the descending aorta. That means the further we can go proximal in the arch, the better it is. Now, having all this in mind and making our life easier and make it basically reproducible for everybody and uh, let me sit in my office while others can do the operation. We developed something that is, in our opinion, a good approach for elective arch surgery. It's not for 2 o'clock in the morning. What we do is we go via the carotid artery. So we first expose both common carotid arteries. We debranch the left subclavian artery to the left carotid artery so that there is a direct flow from the left carotid into the left subclavian. And we put eight or 10 millimeter grafts on the carotid arteries. We connect them to the cardiopulmonary bypass. And it all looks uh, like this. It's difficult to see. We haven't opened the chest. We haven't done anything. We've just put these grafts on. And we are here on the femoral side in cases where we do not want to uh, perfuse the ascending aorta. We measure the blood pressure always on the left and right radial artery and on the femoral artery. So we have complete control over both subclavian arteries and the distal flow. That's the rule. We have neuromonitoring, we have NIRS, we have uh, uh, MAPS and ERPs, and we put a sp um, spinal drain in. That's the rule in all elective cases, if they're more complex than just a straightforward simple arch. So always three arteries, complete control, not just one radial, and then that goes off and you don't know where you are. Here the new trifocotic graph, which makes it easier. It's not absolutely necessary, but we are really moving up into zone zero, so into the ascending aorta, which uh, makes the operation a lot easier, a lot more controllable. And if you have bleeding on that side here, any surgeon can control this bleeding. That's not a problem. It's like being in a normal heart operation, which is day-to-day -day business. The graph is deployed like uh, we always deploy them, either over a wire in the section or directly into the arch. It's a very simple system. It basically is a two-click system. It's not like it was where you had to have millions of mechanisms. And it has one major side arm, two side arms to the side, and one perfusion arm. Now, this beautiful uh, picture was uh, sketched by my senior registrar, Amina, who was doing a lot of imaging for me. It actually shows you what we do with these graphs. So this is the implant. and. That's what is going to happen during the operation. So <coughs> we implant the graft. This is a bit further back. We would really be end up here with the proximal anastomosis, the stent deployed into the descending aorta. Do the suture line. Then connect the side arm, I will show you later, back to the CPD, and we clamp here, and we are back on bypass for the peripheral perfusion. At the same time, we have perfusion over both carotid arteries, so the entire body is perfused. Carotid arteries both sides measured by blood pressure in left and right radial artery, and reperfusion over that arm to distal. This anastomosis usually takes about 30 minutes. So if you are at 18 degrees, you've got more than enough time. Now, that's how it looks when it is all being done. You see, there is the incision on the right, the incision on the left, the grafts going in here, the grafts going there, and the anastomosis between these grafts are easy correctable because we have one anastomosis there, which anybody can get to, 
and we have direct anastomosis here, so we're not sitting somewhere here in the middle of the arch trying to connect the vessels directly, and we have got the side arm for the perfusion, so <coughs> the back is full perfusion. And if there is any bleeding, even in the deepest part, there's no problem to get to anything because the anastomosis between grafts to grafts and there's only anastomosis here on the left and right carotid and then obviously the distal one here which we control while we are uh, doing it. The other possibility in cases where we do not want to uh, overstand or we cannot uh, afford total circulatory arrest in very elderly or patients or patients who have other concomitant problems is we're building a, a landing zone. So what we do is we just do a normal ascending graft, sometimes with the root, and we debranch the left carotid and the right carotid into one graft, coming up very, very proximal of the ascending order. So you've got here about three to <coughs> three centimeters, um, sometimes even more landing zone, which makes uh, specifically looking in the curvature here, an implantation of a graft very easy. You don't have to have any fenestration because we just take them off here, the left subclavian and the left and right carotid. So the second stage uh, procedure is uh, very simple. And this operation is uh, not a major operation. If you just do an ascending aorta with these two grafts, you don't have to cool down at all. All you clamp once, you put the ascending aorta graft in, which takes about 25 minutes, sometimes 30 minutes, because it's really it's the graft end to end, and then you add the carotid arteries. Now, what are the results That's, uh, and why have we actually started? So since 2012, March until March now, we've done 110 the total arch replacements in our institution. It changes over years in terms how many we do. But if you look at the overall survival in uh, all patients, so elective, urgent, and emergency operation, the overall survival was 86.36%. And that, oh, sorry, and that doesn't change over the years. It's sometimes better, sometimes worse, but that is the overall. If you dissect that out in elective operations, so elective arch replacements, the overall survival was 92.59%. But again, if you look here, oh sorry, it does not really change. We don't, we, don't, we have 83% here, there is only 50% small numbers, but uh, it's a good, good result, but it's not uh, really a trend in here. So we're basically doing the same like we did nine years ago. We only started with the, this new operation was obviously our, our vascular surgeon mix and mass and, um, and all my cardiac colleague, George Cesare, in a recent time in selected cases. So we are looking into the numbers and we hopefully will improve the outcome. If you look at urgent operations, which are either dissections or there are patients who dilate very quickly after dissection, survival rate only 72.4%. That's not great. So what was the main problem is paraparesis and stroke. We had four paraparesis cases in the 10 years, of which two were permanent early cases, one in 2017 and one in 2018. And, uh, two later cases which uh, completely resolved. They were both proven uh, by MRI as infarct in the spinal cord at uh, TH3, TH4. Now, you need a big team for that to do that, to get these results. And we've got a huge team with which we work together and that only uh, allows you to get uh, these results in a big series and we're trying to make it obviously now reproducible, and that's hopefully the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Peter will be talking to us fairly quickly on um, failed EVA, top end management options. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll try and, uh, try and speed through this. So, Thanks. Um, <coughs> EVA lends itself to titles such as this in a way that perhaps open repair doesn't because if you have a failed open repair, the patient's dead. So um, we've heard a lot about nice guidance and so on. So we just need to be slightly careful about sensationalising it because ultimately, if this will work, we're talking about management of type 1A endoleaks. So what are uh, type 1A endoleaks? Why do we need to treat them? Why do we need to uh, prevent them? And uh, what can we do about them? 
So these are uh, the different types of endo leaks. Type 1 and type 3 are the ones we really worry about, so high pressure endo leaks. And type 2 and the other types are perhaps more benign. And essentially, it's a ceiling failure at one of the graft attachment sites, 1A being at the top of the graft, 1B being at the bottom of the graft, and 1C uh, being if you've got a crossover graft or, or a branch graft or so on at uh, the uh, join with the uh, target artery. And the arterial flow goes alongside the graft and into the perigraft space. And the issue is this, that if you don't detect these early and you don't treat them early, then patients have a higher aneurysm-related mortality. So this is a surveillance paper, and patients who are compliant with surveillance are in the blue line and non-compliant in the red line. And those on the red line have a higher aneurysm and all-cause um, mortality than those who are compliant. And if you go back to the original trials, uh, the majority of patients with late aortic rupture had sac growth and evidence of either a type 1A, type 3, endoleak or graft migration. And so this combination of endoleak and sac expansion are uh, clearly critical to pick up. But not all type 1 endoleaks are the same, and you need to understand both the timing of them and understand the cause, and that will give you a range of options uh, that you can try. And there are a significant number of options. Some are good, some are bad, and we'll talk about uh, these as we go through. <coughs> so if you're in theatre, or you've got a patient in clinic in front of you with a type 1A one one endoleak, you've got to say, what is the cause? What are options are available to me right now? If I wait, are there better options available down the line? And also, what is the risk to the patient of treating them now or treating them at all? So if we split this out, if you've got an early, by which I really mean intraoperative or immediately post-operative patient, the best way to treat a type 1A endoleak in this situation is to avoid it altogether. So that's good planning, proper planning with 3D, re 3D reconstructions, proper assessment of the neck, accurate sizing of the graft, both under and over sizing can cause type 1A endoleak, and choosing the appropriate type of graft for the pa patient. There's then clearly technical elements about graft placement. You want it to be at the renals, not uh, where you don't want it, several centimetres down. And the graft has to conform. And if there's angulation or calcification, then the graft may not conform as you think it's going to. Where necks are angulated, uh, the true centerline measurement may actually undersize the graft for you. So you may need to think, is this going to lie obliquely? Do we need a bigger graft? Is this the right thing to do at all? So clearly the best way to treat a type 1A endoleak is to avoid it altogether. But this does happen, and we need to try to not let any patient off the table with a type 1A endoleak if we can. But we must not jeopardise later options. So what can we do? The first thing is just a prolonged ballooning of the top end. And a vast majority of type 1A endoleaks, if you go back and you put a sheath up into the uh, body of the graft and do a one minute, two minute balloon at the top end of the, the graft will get better. If the patient is elderly, you can watch and reassess. Is this just a small endoleak in a patient who's got heparin on board? And actually, if we scan this patient a few days, a couple of weeks down the line, this endoleak will have gone. There's an option of endo anchors uh, which Colin spoke about earlier, and uh, I've got a uh, video, video of coming shortly. And this is probably the best time to use endo anchors if you're going to use them. But endo anchors are not a way to treat a, a, an aorta that should not be treated uh, with an endovascular graft. There is a ver an IFU for them that suggests a 4mm neck can be treated. That clearly is not the case. If the graft is low, a cuff can be placed to make up some distance up to the renals. And then there are other options moving higher up, a cuff with a chimney graft. This definitely jeopardizes options further on, so this is your last chance, really, if you're going to do that. And historically, the use of a palm ass stent, and I suspect there are many trainees in, in the audience who haven't even seen a palm ass stent. And again, they definitely jeopardize future options, and I think it's uh, poorly used these days, or, or perhaps 
well, well not used. Um, so these are endo anchors. It's a, it's a lovely cartoon and um, would be great if they worked. And Colin has a different opinion on them to what I do. But um, if you are going to use them, it probably is at the time of the original procedure. If there's a dubious neck or uh, a type 1A endo leak, because this doesn't jeopardize your future options. They're repositionable. Uh, they lie against the graft, and if they don't work, then uh, you have, have an option to do other things later on. They're very expensive, aren't they, Colin? Um, now, if you get an endoleak later on, so in follow-up, months to years down the line, you have to first of all ask, is this definitely a type 1A endoleak? Are you not missing a fabric tear or something else going on? If it is a type 1A, is it because the neck's dilated? And is there graft migration along with it? And you have to make an appropriate assessment of this. So duplex ultrasound, potentially contrast enhanced duplex ultrasound, a good high quality CTA, multiple phases, and potentially angiography. And again, you have to reassess and consider the patient's physiology because some of these interventions are pretty complex, they're pretty expensive, and if a patient was 80 when you put the graft in and they're now 86, 87, you need to consider is doing a very complex intervention in everyone's best interest. So the graft's low, uh, you can place a cuff. You can do a cuff with a chimney, which requires access uh, from brachial break or auxiliary access. You can reline the graft with a fenestrated graft or explant the graft. Some people uh, do use endo anchors and or embolization of endo leaks in this late stage, but I would counsel against this. So in the data around uh, anchors with type 1 leaks late on, around a quarter of the patients in the anchor registry had, uh, were treated solely for a type 1A endo leak, and around half of them still had a type 1A endo leak after the use of anchors. And the conclusion of this review was that alternative strategies such as proximal endograft extension may have better outcomes for treating established 1A endoleaks. And I think certainly in my practice that's right. And so finally we come to what I think is probably the best option for many type 1A endoleaks. Uh, in this case the graft is low but there's a conical neck and a type 1A endoleak and uh, relining the graft either with a fenestrated cuff or full relining uh, seems to be a good solution. But these are complex re-interventions. They are expensive re-interventions, and as I said, it's not for everybody. It's not for all patients, particularly more elderly ones. Um, so I'm just going to leave you with this suggestion um, about how you might think about type 1A one, one endoleaks in terms of timing, in terms of how well the graft is placed, and you need to set all that in the context of the patient themselves. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we haven't got time for questions again. Uh, the next talk is on the application of inner branches in complex EVA. Sayur Bhutti, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay. So I'm just going to give an overview about inner branches in complex EVA, not a specific uh, design or anything. So. The concept comes from, we've heard about endograft, and we heard about the ceiling zone, and just for the benefit of everyone here, the ceiling zone is where the proximal endograft sit, and you can either have fenestration or you can have branches, and the inner branch concept is branches are from the inside. So you're utilizing the ceiling zone and reduce the amount of graft above the uh, target vessel or around the target vessel, which is, should be a good thing. It is an alternative, and it is, has advantages in specific anatomy. And there's clearly evolving role for it in the last few years. We've seen it. We probably never heard about it four or five years ago, but we're kind of increasingly hearing about it and seeing it. But what's wrong with fenestration and conventional branches? We've been doing them for years, and they seem to work. They are really good options, and we're still doing them. But there are problems with fenestration, for example, this has to match, and it's easy when you have a straight aorta, large target vessel, but when you have angulation, if it doesn't match, you might make your operation difficult. 
If the anatomy is not in your favor, if you have deformation, eyelid angulation, all these factors we've been through it, we've seen they can make the operation difficult. It's not only long day in theater, but also increased risk of complication, vessel dissection, when you try to track stent and wires against all the normal angul angulation. The other thing about fenestration, we more and more seeing a bridging stent failure. And we probably never thought about the gap between the aortic stent graft and the target vessel as much as before. But now in fenestration, we cannot achieve it in all situations. And if there is a gap, that means bridging stent fracture, that means re-intervention. So you are building up potential problems. What about conventional branches? I think they are good. We like them. There is a good overlap between the bridging stent and the branch, but there's increased aortic coverage, and that comes with the cost of spinal cord ischemia. And obviously, there's a longer gap between the bridging stent and the target vessel, which is also, again, source of problems. So what are the advantages? Perhaps the first thing is the ability to work in a narrow aortic lumen. And the second thing is to overcome one of the adverse features of PVAR. And if you can achieve shorter aortic uh, coverage by changing the design, that's great news. It's also, they are relatively easier to use because you are closer to your target vessel. This is overview of how they look like. This is just one design. And this is uh, the inner branches from inside. This is how they look from the outside. And this is the way they look uh, sideways. And this is with the uh, x-ray if you face in one AP, anterior posterior, or lateral. So we, we had the ability to try all of them. This is the one we tried most. Uh, um, uh, let's go back one. This is another design we tried less, and the last one we just tried recently as a part of research study. Because we tried most uh, the geotech design, we published our data recently in Journal of Vascular Surgery. And we looked at cases when, since we started from 2018 towards the early of 2020 before COVID started to hit. We actually looked at all cases, fenestrator and branch, and we just scrutinized the geotech one. And this is a typical case you would use. Uh, suprarenal, type 4 maybe, downward renal, very angulated ilex, as you see, and, and the usual uh, demographics of all these patients where you know you can be fenestrated, but it's going to be a long day. This is uh, the selection criteria. And as you see, the main reason is when you have unfavorable target vessel for fenestrators when you have excessive angulation. And these are the cases where really they would benefit. There are other factors like reducing the coverage, narrow lumen, not enough for standard branch repair. And also in specific, we found it useful in certain treatment for type 1A, where we have a short limb by the EVA. And I'll come to this later. This is the data from our series, and it's very comparable to any branch or fenestrated repair. Obviously, there's a learning curve. So this is the outcome. We didn't have an early mortality. We had one late mortality, which is not uh, aortic related, eudenal ulcer. We had intervention, as you would expect with any uh, endovascular treatment, one early intervention, one late, so about 10%. So all aneurysms so far excluded. Uh, at the time of uh, publication, there is one now which is expanding potentially of infection. There is uh, no type 1 or 3 endoleaks. And, uh, the, the number of cases increasing, and we'll be looking into the long-term data uh, as we go along. So what are the benefits? Try to summarize in four slides here. I think this is the main thing, is really working with your angulation. If you imagine you try to do fenestrated for this angulation or this angulation, you can do it, but you can try to upsize your wire and stiffness and all these kind of things. It's really unnecessary. It's much easier to do it the right way. Oh, different way. The other thing I found it useful, you can tailor your proximal length. You can make it 36, you can make it, I think this slide is going on its own, but uh, uh, 60, you can make it 88. I prefer the 60 or the 45 above the celiac if possible, because that kind of keeps it limited from a coverage point of view. This is a specifically useful thing. We've all heard earlier about the treatment of failed EVA, and they often have a short main body here. 
And that makes it difficult sometimes because if you have to place a fenestrated, you have to have a proximal fenestrated component. You have to have a, a inverted body, distal limb, multiple components, increased risk of type three injury. So having a design with the integrated limbs, which you can place it, your branches are above your target vessel, you're working away from all the difficulties and risks, and all what you need to do when you plug the branch is just to put two limbs. And I think that makes it simple and potentially reduce your risk of intercomponents issues. Uh, finally, this is maybe personal preference, I find that it has more room to do your steerable sheet and more stability. Uh, and finally, the other advantage, we are starting to see of the shelf generation, that's the first generation, I'm sure more and more will come. Where we are then, we are looking at the future of this, and as I said, it's all uh, early days, so we need to have the long-term data reported. We need to be very cautious in our selection, and only those who would really benefit from this technology maybe should qualify for it. It's very likely to see further development, different version, different design, shorter version. So with the off-the-shelf and the, the different technology we see, we're very likely to see wider applicability of this technology. So we look forward. Uh, thank you. That's all. <laughs> Yes, so thank you so much for that. That's an excellent um, and very promising series. Questions later. Thank you. And, um, the next will be um, customized TIVA approaches to arch aneurysms, effectiveness and durability. And that's Professor Hamad. Thanks, Adi. Uh, good afternoon to you again. So the, uh, the aneurysms and the distal ascending arch and proximal descending, they frequently present with peculiar anatomical uh, issues. So we frequently have short landing zone, angulation, non-uniformity of the uh, diameter. We frequently encounter large diameter uh, landing zones. We might have dissection flap extending to the uh, arch and near the grade vessels. The presence of grade vessels obviously make the manipulation of uh, quite a high risk because of, uh, of stroke. And uh, also we might encounter mechanical bulbs which limits the options that are available. Having said that, also we, we shouldn't forget the physiological challenges in this area. With a, there is a lot of hemodynamics going on, high velocity, increased aortic deformity, the twisting movement of the arch and the cardiac motion and the distribution of shear stress. All that imply a lot of uh, demand on the quality and the features of the technology we use and subsequently the uh, success and durability. We have a, a lot of options available. We've been hearing throughout the day uh, what we can uh, do there. Uh, but we'll concentrate on the custom grafts, mainly the scallops and the fenestrated uh, stands for the purpose of this talk. The uh, perceived benefits or the potential benefits of those uh, mainly fenestration and uh, scallops or uh, fenestration with or without stenting is the, the fact that they are less invasive, there is minimal manipulation, uh, it widens the scope of treated pathology, create a proximal landing zone for thracoabdominal aneurysms, and it is conceivable to raise the question, uh, do they work, and if they work, are they durable? I'll present a few examples just to show you the range of um, the usage of those devices and also the combination of the uh, design. This is a case, um, an elderly patient with a history of uh, cabbage and lima and presents with a penetrating aortic ulcer. This is the lima, this is the, the, uh, the cursor there where the penetrating uh, ulcer. So obviously there is no really good room uh, without doing uh, a lot of uh, intervention in the arch. This was treated with a single fenestration stent that was uh, stented, um, and the, that's the, the, the stent and the single fenestration without compromising the origin of the left common carotid artery, and that's the final product. Uh, this is another interesting case uh, 
a 67 year old male, chronic type B dissection, seven centimeter aneurysm and the proximal uh, descending. The true lumen completely occluded just below the level of the renal arteries and there is no continuation of true lumen, only false lumen. And if we look uh, further at the uh, interrogate the proximal landing zone, the distance from the uh, primary entry tear to the left subclavian is 2.8. The distance to the um, left carotid is 17 millimeter. It's only when you reach the nominate that you obtain a reasonable landing zone. This was uh, approached from uh, anti-grade, uh, anti-gradely and with the help of IVAS punctured the true lumen into the false near the wire and then retrogradely advance a scallop to the uh, left common carotid artery while doing the left carotid left subclavian bypass. So converting a fairly complex pathology into a relatively simple solution with good results, as you can see, complete thrombosis false lumen. There's another case with uh, thoracoabdominal acute angulation of the arch. There is a very uh, hostile neck that this case was actually declined by uh, Cook initially for a branch case because of the proximal landing zone. There are a lot other uh, challenges in the renal arteries, angulations, the, the downstream of the celiac and the, uh, and the SMA and tight osteostenosis of both. And this was treated with a, um, a, uh, a scallop to the, um, in, uh, to the um, left, left common carotid and innominate with, sorry, scallop to the left subclavian artery creating the proximal landing zone and then enabling the anti-grade cannulation of the four uh, branches. Another case, similar pathology, uh, difficult hostile landing zone treated with a scallop and uh, it, this enables the anti-grade cannulation despite the acute angulation of the arch. And in this particular case, there was a mechanical bulb, which means even if we consider branching arch, it would not be an easy solution, it would be very challenging. This is uh, uh, another case with, uh, again, a chronic type B dissection extending into the left uh, subclavian. The, uh, the, uh, there is a mechanical valve as well, and this was uh, treated with a large fenestration that accommodated the left common carotid and the left and the nominate artery. Um, and we, uh, enabling the, uh, the rest of the stent. This was in, in the context of visceral hybrid. Uh, we published the, our early experience back in 2016 as a feasibility uh, report and then short-term report and earlier this year we published the midterm results. Uh, 38 uh, patients, that's the, the usual demographics of those patients. The interesting thing that uh, most of those patients, they, have, uh, they had type 2 and 3 arch, so that's quite angulated arch. The, um, the atheroma was quite high, grade 3 and 4 in most of those, uh, or in significant portion of those patients. A range of pathology, the landing zone was m mostly um, left subclavian, but also included zone 0 and 1. And the targeted vessels uh, vascularized were 41, uh, 30. 8% of those in the cohort uh, had an extra anatomical bypass, not only in the R, some of them visceral hybrids. So it's a bit um, heterogeneous group, but it does tell the story. The uh, technical success rates was quite high, 98%, and the in-hospital mortality, uh, 8%, was much lower in the, those without um, uh, bypass uh, surgery, ad uh, adjunct bypass surgery. The uh, stroke rate was 8% and uh, zero uh, TIA and paraplegia was 5%. There was no migration in all those. There was only one type one uh, endoleak. Retrospectively, there was a growth in the, in the aneurysm proximal to the uh, landing zone. The uh, sex size remained stable or decreased in 92% of patients and freedom from reintervention for the proximal landing zone in the majority of patients, 97%. This experience was mirrored also in a, a, a group in Germany who published a similar experience but with a different device. 
and 44 uh, patients with um, less than uh, two years follow-up, um, seven scallops, fenestration uh, eight, and combination of scallop and fenestration 21 and 13 bypasses, and they also get very high technical success rate of 95% and 9% mortality. The uh, reintervention was also uh, a small percentage of reintervention, and the majority of patients remained free from the need to reintervene. The stroke rate was also eight, around 8% eight, uh, in zone 0 and 9 in zone 1 and 2. So to conclude, custom-made fenestration and scallop stents are safe and effective alternative option. The valuable addition to the armamentarium of the uh, arch and the options available to us, and they provide, or the initial results shows that they provide good midterm durability. Thank you. So at the start, we were threatened if we didn't keep to time, we would have to cancel Tara. But I'm glad to say, due to the professionals and the excellence of all of our speakers, we can introduce Tara Mastrachi to come and tell us about complications after complex aneurysm repair. I think you've got ages. Oh, well, I won't use it. Uh, my plan is already to, uh, to shorten this a bit so that it, there could be a bit of discussion. Uh, congratulations to the organizers. I know it must have been uh, very uh, difficult to uh, organize a meeting like this during a pandemic, uh, and thank you for the invitation uh, and the ability to represent BARTS. So I've been given the uh, inauspicious um, joy of being the last speaker and also presenting my complications, so thank you. Uh, these are my probably relevant disclosures. And because this has always traditionally been a training meeting, I thought it would be useful to start in a way that you would answer the exam question of what are the complications of endo-TAA. Namely, they're usually temporally organized, perioperative versus long-term, and then split into medical and surgical. But let's be honest, we all care a little bit more about the surgical ones than the medical ones. And our colleagues across the globe have been very busy during the pandemic. There have been a load of beautiful uh, publications in 2021 about the long-term <coughs> effects or the reintervention rate or the complications, however you want to kind of uh, say it, uh, of large series of, of thoracal abdominal aneurysms. The first one I'm presenting is this one from Italy, uh, a group of 221 fenestrated and branched devices. And they quote overall a 19% <coughs> rate of reintervention over time. But I think what I really like about this and why I'm highlighting it first is that this paper tells us that there's 5% of the people actually required more than one reintervention. And any of you who operate on these aneurysms frequently know that once you get a patient with an endo leak, they tend to not go away. So it really kind of, it keeps with the practice and anecdotally what we think. Risk factors for reintervention tend to be doing a procedure in an emergency or renal failure over the long term. And you can see that the re-interventions that they quote are the ones that you see on the operating list at the end of your bigger case um, anytime you have to do a re-intervention. Looking at large single centers, you couldn't really have a conversation like this without talking about Gustavo Oderich's outcomes. He has 430 patients in the Mayo Clinic experience that uh, he just left. And you can see that the 30-day mortality is what you expect, a lot of access problems, the occasional paraplegia. But what's important is that if you look at the aortic complications over time, he's really reporting endo leaks from target vessels. And that's really what we want to focus on. Because when you talk about device failure, the devices that I see failing are failing because they have endo leaks from target vessels. The same is true if you look at the uh, longest running and largest uh, English experience. Uh, this shows us 236 patients over almost 10 years. Again, we're seeing that number of almost 20% visceral complications. They report that covered stents are better than un uncovered stents. Unfortunately, this is a conclusion we came to a long time ago. But beautifully, you, if you have long-term data, you get to kind of constantly see that um, outcome. And they also said that there was no territory at higher risk, which I take some exception to, but you have to believe the numbers that they're reporting. Other groups who report branch stent complications talk to us about configurations, whether or not we should be relining or not. And very ironically, and contrary to my own experience, this Italian group has found that in fact relining a, a, a stent in a branch uh, causes a, a more likely rate of endo leak over time, which is an interesting note and a technical note uh, over time. And finally, the largest experience in the world now is that group of American surgeons that call themselves the aortic consortium. Uh, which are all the IDEs in the United States. And they have now uh, amassed about 866 patients uh, with a target vestal instability rate of somewhere around 87 to 89%, depending on how they break it down. But the bottom line is, all of these 
these groups that are doing high volume aortic surgery are getting pretty good at getting patients through the immediate short term risks. And so really when we talk about complications, we need to kind of retool what we're talking about as endovascular surgeons because we can get most people through an operation. Um, but the question really is how long will that operation last and how durable is the repair? And I would argue when we talk about complications, we should start talking about complications that are due to technique, which is learning curve, and stuff that as surgeons we can all change because we can learn from our mistakes, and other complications that are due to judgment. And judgment really has a lot to do with auditing your data over the long term and changing your practice in keeping with trends. And I wanted to go through two cases that kind of show the difference between technique and judgment. Unfortunately, because um, we don't have a lot of time, I'm afraid I won't be able to tell you the whole story. But any endovascular surgeon in the uh, room will be able to tell you what the technique problem is for this renal complication. This is a short tip implants that is far too deep in the kidney. And unfortunately, occasionally, even someone with as much gray hair as me pokes a patient in the kidney. And if you're smart enough to figure it out, um, you end up um, rescuing it with a coil. And although this is a technical complication, it is one that is survivable if you have the judgment to figure out how to fix it. So here's the bleed, as you can all see and then subsequently the coil. And the patient did make it out of the hospital, thankfully, without paraplegia uh, and, and lived to fight another day. A, a complication that relies on judgment is actually a little bit more humbling to present, but in the interest of, uh, of being upfront and, and giving you a good presentation, I'll show you this one. This is a recent patient of mine, 67-year-old man, who recently had had an MI. He was not fit for open surgery. He really wanted his aneurysm repaired. He had complications of a long-standing smoking history and um, depression. And as you can see in this uh, aortic angiogram, he has a lot of shaggy aorta. Now, I usually report about or uh, predict or consent about 30% complication of embol embolic problems after a, 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 an aorta that looks like this. And in fact, even with that complication rate, he still wanted to go ahead. We had a little bit of intraoperative hypotension, so I did an angiogram of the kidney artery because that's usually where it comes from. And if you can see uh, that there is a little bit of bleeding from the kidney, which is kind of right around there, hardly perceptible, but we stented it and, and really kind of congratulated ourselves for getting out of dodge and did an immediate post-operative CT scan, which showed uh, beautiful kidneys. But it also showed, frighteningly, a couple of um, emboli in the spleen and in the liver. And subsequently, the patient went on not only to be paraplegic, but also to develop an ischemic pancreatitis, which goes to show you that no matter how good your technique is, if you don't have the judgment to know that you shouldn't be operating on people with shaggy aorta, uh, then you're likely to have poorer outcomes. So I call this the spandex shorts rule. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. That guy had really beautiful anatomy, uh, but we probably shouldn't have operated on him. And so I'll give you the benefit of my years of experience and three surefire methods for improving judgment in aortic surgery, at least endoaortic surgery. The first one is don't take shortcuts, like I try to in that patient. Um, and finally, I've been able to kind of quantify what I mean by this. So before leaving the Royal Free, I did an audit of the practice there, and we had 159 patients with juxtarenal and group four thoracal abdominal aneurysms. And there was a really nice um, way to divide the practice. We started out doing scallops for the celiac, and then we started, for a lot of technical reasons, always having fabric above the celiac artery, always putting a, a fenestration for the celiac. And then subsequently, we started to realize that we actually didn't need to stent those fenestrations, so we left some of them unstented. And the outcomes of this proved something that we have really known for a long time, that you get a great deal of target vessel instability if you are not stenting above the celiac artery. If you do not use a four-vessel fenestrated device, if you're using any kind of scallop uh, in the visceral segment, your, your short-term outcomes are beautiful, but your long-term outcomes are not going to be as nice. And you know, I can credit Yasmin Uden, the, uh, the nurse clinician at the Royal Free, for an amazing follow-up. We have great compliance with follow-up there. But you can see that the re-intervention for the patients who uh, had only scallops was remarkably higher in the short term. And that's because the device was just sitting in a very bad landing zone. And so I would highly recommend not taking shortcuts, four vessel fenestrated all the way. It used, to be, it used to be heresy, but you can see even back in the Cleveland Clinic days, we knew that these devices were not going to work. 
The second, which rolls nicely from that, is auditing and definitely looking for trends. And you have to be honest with yourself about your data. The peer-reviewed le literature lets us down. If you look at any of the papers that I quoted at the beginning of this, they have three, perhaps close to four year outcomes. But their, their time to event statistics stretch way beyond what they're statistic statistically able to do. If you look at the number of people at risk at five years, at 10 years, at, at 60 months in any of those groups, the degree of accuracy of those judgments is very, very low. We need to audit our own data and to know what the truth is uh, for, for long-term outcomes. And finally, I'll tell you a perhaps optimistic point of this talk is that it's important to harness technology. Um, we now use fusion imaging almost as a standard, and I'm sure everyone in the room does, and originally that was just to guide our experience uh, and guide our, our catheters, but we're learning more and more from that fusion. Myself and Blondine uh, Morel at Nantes put together our experience of fusion over the last couple of years, looking specifically at deformation data, and we have started to learn very nicely the direction that vessels are likely to move when we stick a stent graft in, and in fact, if you look at the internal iliacs or the iliac um, uh, territories, they're far more difficult to predict than if you look at the visceral territories. This kind of information is going to feed how we design stent grafts in the future, and it's going to perhaps give us even more information about what will make a more durable repair. And that's just the beginning. If you talk to SIDAR or any of the groups that are looking at uh, AI and, and machine learning in this space, what they're going to tell you is that they can extract a great deal of data that our eye can't see. And I think we have to keep a close eye on this and humbly accept it into our practice to inform our decisions. I used to say for a really long time that time was the most important force exerted on a stent, but I'm starting to believe more and more that actually surgical judgment is. And if we don't honestly review our data and look at what we're doing, we'll never be able to have a more durable repair for patients in the future. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tara, for that. That's really excellent. And we would like to thank all our speakers this session for uh, doing their best to keep within, within time. It would have been nice to take questions, but I think we're going to get through an hour if we try that. So I'm going to ask John to... Uh, I'd just like to say a few words. Yes. Uh, very brief. First of all, thank you, all of you who are here and those who are not here, uh, for having the confidence to come to a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, it, it's been tremendous. Uh, we've had some fantastic speakers with some very uh, interesting questions, and we've had great uh, chairmanship. I'd like to thank, I'm just a spokesman for the organizing committee, so I'd like to thank the organizing committee. But the biggest thanks I'd like to give is to Jeanette Oliver, to Petter, and Susie, who are up there organizing the chairs and uh, 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 looking after me. <laughs> uh, and they've done a great job. So we're going to do it again, and I think this is a good venue, and we'll see if we can't uh, get a slot next year at the RCP. So thank you, and have a safe journey home.